Truth-Telling and Advocacy. You will recall in the preamble, we learned that the attorney is a representative of clients, an officer of the court, and a public citizen with special obligations. Rules 3.1 through 3.5 deal with the attorney as officer of the court. You will also recall that the preamble predicted that the conflicts an attorney faces often arise due to conflicts amongst these three roles. Rule 3.1 prohibits the attorney from presenting arguments or pleadings unless there is a basis in law and fact for the claim. This ethical rule should be read in conjunction with the rules of civil procedure and the rules of appellate procedure. Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure states that when a lawyer signs a pleading, the lawyer is certifying that to the best of the lawyer's knowledge, formed after a reasonable inquiry, the lawyer is not submitting the paper for any improper purpose, and the contentions have support. Improper purposes include making frivolous arguments or causing needless delay. Of course, the criminal defendant is not governed by the rules of civil procedure. A criminal defense attorney is permitted to defend to put the prosecution to the test of proving the client guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This difference is due to the defendant's constitutional right to counsel and constitutional right against self-incrimination. You'll recall that under Rule 1.4, it is the client's choice whether to plead guilty or not guilty. So, the criminal defense attorney may, indeed often must, defend a client he knows has no case. But no other lawyer may do this. The obligation to avoid frivolous matters applies to the case in chief as well as any particular pleading or request for relief in the case. Rule 3.2 requires that the attorneys expedite the matter to the extent this is not inconsistent with the client's interests. The attorney should never ask for an extension merely to obtain a tactical advantage. Rule 3.3 requires that the attorney not present evidence she knows to be false. This means if the attorney knows the witness is lying, the attorney may not call the witness to present that false evidence. If the witness testifies for the lawyer and presents evidence that the lawyer knows is false, the lawyer must take corrective action. Generally, the lawyer will consult with the witness and remonstrate the witness to return to the stand to correct the false testimony. However, if that is not successful, the attorney must inform the court about the false evidence that has been presented. This obligation to take corrective action continues to the conclusion of the proceeding. This prohibition of presenting false evidence applies not only at trial, but to depositions or to answers to interrogatories. If the lawyer learns that her witness or client has presented false evidence, she must correct it. This seems to fly in the face of the principle of confidentiality. That is correct. The lawyer's obligation as an officer of the court in the quest for truth trumps the lawyer's obligation to the client. The attorney must not assist the client in perpetrating a fraud upon the court. The obligation to blow the whistle on a client or witness that lies is only slightly changed in the criminal defendant context. Even with a criminal defendant, the attorney may not knowingly present false evidence and must correct false evidence that is presented. However, because it is the client's ultimate decision whether to testify, some courts will permit criminal defendants to take the stand and provide an unassisted narrative, which the attorney may not rely upon in closing argument. Some who read the rules imagine that one can never know a client or witness is lying. Please consult the definition of know and knowing in the rules terminology. While often the attorney only suspects his client or witness is being untruthful, sometimes the lawyer will know. Note that this rule also permits the attorney to decline to call a witness if she believes the witness will present false evidence. This applies to any witness other than a criminal defendant. Note that the prohibition is against false evidence, not only against lies. Thus, if the witness mistakenly believes she is telling the truth, but the lawyer knows the evidence is false, the lawyer is still prohibited from presenting the witness. Rule 3.3 also prohibits the attorney from presenting law that she knows to be incorrect. This concern does not typically arise, but occasionally the opposing counsel may not know the correct legal standard based on an on-point case. If that happens, the lawyer who knows that law is obligated to make certain the judge is not misled as to the relevant law. Finally, Rule 3.3 deals with ex parte proceedings. 
the attorney must tell the judge of all material facts known to the lawyer to enable the judge to make the right decision in an ex parte proceeding. Rule 3.4 requires that the lawyer not unlawfully obstruct another party's access to evidence. One thing the attorney needs to know is what is unlawful obstruction of access to evidence. Here the attorney needs to consult other law, such as federal obstruction of justice statutes, 18 U.S.C.A. 1512. In Utah, and in most states, there are also state statutes dealing with obstruction of justice, Utah Code Annotated 76-8-306, and tampering with the evidence, Utah Code 76-8-510.5. Basically, if the attorney knows that a proceeding has begun or is going to begin, the attorney may not destroy evidence. These statutes obviously prohibit altering or destroying evidence. Sometimes the lawyer may be justified in taking temporary possession of physical evidence to test it, but in such a case the attorney must return the evidence so that it will be accessible to the opposing side. Under Rule 3.4, the attorney is prohibited from making frivolous discovery requests and from failing to diligently reply to opposing parties' discovery requests. In a trial, the attorney may not allude to any matter that the lawyer does not reasonably believe is relevant or will be supported by admissible evidence. Accordingly, cross-examination questions that ask the witness when he stopped beating his wife are impermissible unless there is affirmative admissible evidence that the witness did beat his wife. The lawyer may not state a personal opinion as to the culpability of a party, the justness of the cause, or the credibility of a witness. At trial, counsel cannot say, I know this man and he would never commit such a crime. Instead, the attorney must say, I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that the defendant's entire life history is evidence that he would never commit such a crime. The attorney may not ask a person other than the client to refrain from giving relevant information to the opposing side unless the person is a close relative or employee of the client and the lawyer reasonably believes that the person's interest will not be adversely affected by not giving such information. Thus, the corporate attorney may ask all corporate employees not to talk to the plaintiffs, unless some of the employees might actually have interest that would be advanced by the opposing party learning their evidence. Rule 3.5 deals with impartiality and decorum in court. Attorneys may not seek to influence judges or jurors by illegal means or engage in conduct intended to disrupt a tribunal. Attorneys may not communicate ex parte unless ex parte communication is authorized. Ex parte hearings may be authorized in certain cases, for example, in cases of domestic violence. But as Rule 3.3 established, any authorized ex parte communications must inform the tribunal of all material facts. Rule 3.5 also deals with the attorney polling the jury after the case is over. The attorney may not communicate with the juror if it is against the law, or if the juror has made known her desire not to communicate, or if the communication involves misrepresentation, coercion, duress, or harassment. Finally, the lawyer is prohibited from engaging in conduct intended to disrupt the tribunal. This ends our review of the 3.1 through 3.5 rules.